So we were aware, very aware of all these limitations. So you can imagine when women from a village come with a book to you in the city, and that book is about women, how exciting the whole process is. And they had made handmade two copies of this book, and they brought them to us, and they, the book was covered, every single page was covered in plastic. And that plastic was a plastic lifafa that they had got in the village somewhere and sealed with using a candle. And it was covered in plastic because when they made a copy of the book by hand and then everybody was sharing it and looking at it, they found that some child would pee on the book or some water would spill or something. And th so they decided that the way to save it is to cover it in plastic. So they covered it in plastic. And the other thing, I wish I had the book with me to show you. I, because I'm such a words person, I always forget the visuals. But um, you know, the other thing was that to show the woman's body, they had drawn the naked woman and the naked body. Obviously, you have to show the body parts. It's a book about how the body changes from childhood to old age. And when they tested the book in the village, everybody said to them, this is rubbish. It's not at all realistic. You never see a naked woman in a village, so how can you call this realistic? So they went back to the drawing board and they came up with this absolutely ingenious solution, which was that they made pictures of the woman fully dressed as she might be covered from head to toe. So lehenga, choli, orni, and then you had a little flap that you lifted up and you had a little window that you opened and you could see how she was made. And similarly, you had the man in the dhoti with his chest bare, but man wearing dhoti. Then you lifted up the dhoti and you could see how he was made. It was a completely brilliant book. So we, and they made one condition with us. They said, the one condition we'll impose on you is, if you sell copies of this book to village women, you'll sell them for two rupees, and you can sell them in the market at whatever cost you like, whatever price you like, we don't care. So we said, fine, and we printed initially 2,000 copies of the book. Before we had finished printing, they had actually canvassed in the villages around them and sold 1,800 of those 2,000. And then when the book was printed, now everything was done by hand at that time. Today it's a very different printing world. I didn't intend to tell you the story at length, so my talk will now get longer by the five minutes it's taken me to tell you this story. Um, but uh, everything was done by hand, so those little chepis, you know, the windows and the flaps and all of that, they had to be pasted by hand. And everything was done by hand by small Muslim boys who worked in Balimaran in Old Delhi, because binding is a profession that is largely hand binding, was in the hands of Muslims, and binders employed these little boys. Okay? So the binder one day rang us up and said, Madam, we can't do this book. And we said, why can't you do it? He said, Woh ladke aur kuch dekh hi rahe hai. Woh gandhi gandhi photo ko dekh rahe. So, <laughs> So we had to take it away from there. And then one of the young women who worked with us found a women's binding group. And they took it on. And then they bound the book for us until they disbanded. That women's binding group was part of a group called Action India, Gauri Chaudhary's group, which some of you may know. So anyway, this kind of thing enriched the publishing that we did. And it was all very exciting, but it was also a very, very lonely furrow in the sense that there were other small publishers, a few of them doing work, but we were mostly on our own. And gradually the broad publishing scene began to change. Some of the changes were good and some of the changes were quite bad. And the changes started in about the late 80s, early 90s. Um, Partly, the first change began to happen, which was good for us, when there was the first fall of the rupee against the dollar. What that meant was that India, a big market for imported books from America and England, it's the third largest market for English language books in the world, so it, we were a, a big market for book imports from there, and a stable market in the sense that book exports from Britain and the US to Africa, they were always uncertain whether they would get the money back. But from India, they knew they would get the money back even though it might take longer. So we were a big import market. But when the dollar went up and the rupee fell, 
Then those books became quite expensive to import. The prices went up, like they went up um, maybe 50% or some such thing. So the units of books, the numbers of books that were imported went down. And that made a little space in bookshops for publishers like us who were beginning to publish books for general readers as opposed to books which are prescribed for educational use, which is what had dominated the Indian publishing market. So we were going against the grain and saying that there is a general reader out there who might be read a novel, who might read an information book, who might read a book on dowry, and we are publishing for that reader. But without the infrastructure of bookshops and so on, it was very difficult to find that reader, to read the books to that reader. So it seemed like publishing in the dark a little bit. And when bookshops, the few bookshops that there were, found it difficult to stock foreign books because of the rise in foreign exchange, I mean, in the dollar, then we were able to go to them and say, Acha, hamari kitab rakhi. And we got a little space. But also what started to happen was that India started to open up to foreign capital. And that meant that the um, colonial publishers and international publishers could re-enter this market. Now, initially as in joint ventures with Indian uh, publishers or Indian companies, and later they could re-enter it as a 100% owned business. While this was happening, at the same time, in India, a lot of young and independent publishers started publishing. You started to see many changes. You started to see changes in the sense that, you know, the, in, among, in, among publishers, we talk of the Lala model of publishing as being one that dominates India, which is that there are all these Lalas who run publishing houses. They don't know much about books. They are basically printers who have come into publishing or booksellers who have come into publishing. And their children inherit the publishing. But with their children and their children's children inheriting, you began to see a professionalization of publishing, which you had not seen before. You began to see, interestingly, the entry of a lot of women into publishing. And a lot of women, young women, and women starting up their own publishing houses you began to see politically engaged publishers who were publishing books on Dalit literature, who were publishing books on tribal literature, etc. So you got a publishing scene that was dominated by the big international publishers coming into India, and you got a scene on the ground where there was all this exciting stuff happening with new explorations and new publishers bringing up new subject areas. And you started to see the ways in which the big publishers were then drawing on these and taking those, those areas. Once a new area had been discovered, they would then step into it and cream it off and take it away. It wasn't the, so we began to ask ourselves, is this a recolonization of publishing? Is this happening again? And uh, what was there earlier? Is this the same thing that is happening? Also, what began to happen was that the big publishers began to concentrate on the mass market book, the more popular book, the Chetan Bhagats and the Amish Tripathis and the other sort of books. Now, the thing about that is that while these books are not necessarily great in terms of literary value, but what they were doing was opening up a world of readership that we had never seen before. Um, and, you know, all of these developments happened roughly at the same time, which radically changed the publishing scene. As the shopping mall came in, for example, and spread all over India, so also inside the shopping mall, the bookshop came in. And you started to see bookshop chains. Crossword was the first one, then you saw Landmark, then you saw Odyssey, and so on. They started to come in. Some of them have closed up, but many of them are still there. So you saw, saw bookshop chains, you saw independent bookshops coming up, and the number of retail outlets grew. Also, things like the Big Bazaar started to sell books through some of their outlets. And so you got the supermarket customer coming in and finding books where they did not expect to find them. And of course, you could not expect that a book by Jean-Paul Sartre or Arundhati Roy would be the one that would be bought there. 
Rather, a book by Chetan Bhagat or Ramesh Tripathi or somebody would be bought there. So many changes. You know, you started to see the development of independent publishing. You started to see the entry of young people. You started to see a whole range of new subjects coming in. You started to see international publishers coming in. You started to see increase in the number of bookshops and therefore different kinds of books being sold through bookshops. And also another complication, which was that all the international publishers who came in, they were not bringing in foreign authors. They were actually publishing Indian authors. So if you look at HarperCollins, you look at Penguin, you look at Random House, you look at anybody, the big names, who are they publishing? They're publishing Indian authors. By and large, Indian authors in English, but they're publishing Indian authors. Also, what began to happen, as you will know from the newspaper revolution, that the greatest growth in newspapers in their circulation is in the Indian languages, not in English. And that is reflected also in books. So publishing in the Indian languages began to develop in a way that it never had before. And a lot of translation started to happen between Indian languages and English and between different Indian languages. All these changes were happening at the same time. The impact that this had on um, reading and writing in India, I think, is one of the major things that it did was to demystify the act of writing. 